So the sales team at AirSlate gets a lot of questions every day, particularly about our Sign Now and AirSlate products. So we came up with a list of the uh, five of the most common questions that the team got this week. And I thought, who better to ask these two than Colin, our head of customer solutions. So uh, Colin, thanks for, uh, thanks for doing this. Absolutely. The first question that I get is, um, what are bots? Are they the same as RPA? What's, what's the difference? Yeah, so in the AirSlate world, bots are a really important part of the product and what it can do. Um, we talk about it as a form of robotic process automation. It may not be quite exactly what people think of when they hear that term RPA. Um, and that's because a lot of times people think of RPA as a tool which goes and it opens up your existing software applications or maybe a government website and it can interact with and click on that software the same way a human would. Copy and paste information, click on buttons, that kind of thing. Um, now our bots, in the same way as RPA, they're no code, configurable integrations to other tools, um, but they don't impersonate a person when they're doing their work. They use the official supported APIs from the target systems that we're integrating to. Um, and the reason that's good is because by using the official APIs, the bot setup won't break when there's changes. And that's one of the classic problems with RPA. You have to keep going and reconfiguring it because you know, the website that you're copying and pasting from changed slightly and now the bot is confused. So using these APIs, we can roll out uh, system specific bots that very quickly and we have hundreds. That's the other thing is that you know, everybody may have a different layout on their Salesforce page. So if you integrate to it by opening it and copying and pasting, that's not going to work for everybody's Salesforce. However, the Salesforce API works the same way for everybody's Salesforce. So we can very easily integrate just using that as one example. Uh, the other piece that's worth mentioning is that our bots are not all integrations. I and mean, certainly if you just talk about the hundreds of bots we have, the majority of them are integrations, but we also have a number that automate tasks or configurations inside the AirSlate workflow. Things like uh, disabling um, the signature stamp or requiring a person to draw their signature instead of type it. Uh, some things like that also go through bots. Cool, thank you. Um, another question that we get, you know, sort of along the same lines is, what does no code really mean? Uh, is there a difference between low code and no code? Um, what is no code all about? We see that on social media all the time and customers see that and they wonder what that truly means. Yeah, that's a great question. It's a huge source of confusion in the market. And uh, I'd mentioned no code. I threw that out already when I was talking about bots. People often do say no code slash low code when they're talking about it. And uh, our friends at Forrester Research have said, you shouldn't lump those together. Uh, there is a common thread, which is that both are meant to be faster ways of speeding up custom application development rather than hiring developers to write a bunch of code. You can have people use a no code slash low code tool to do that development more quickly, but uh, they're really intended for different kinds of builders. So no code is what it sounds like. You can configure an air slate flow and a complex automation and fairly complex integrations without writing any code. It's all click on the bot you want, point and click uh, which Salesforce object you want to integrate to, point and click on drop down fields to map the Salesforce fields onto your document and so forth. So it's not low code, it's literally no code. Um, and so that's for business analysts or citizen developers who don't have formal IT or computer science training. In contrast, the low code tools are for developers. Um, so it is low code, so there is some amount of code involved. And the idea there is that you can make your existing developers more productive, which certainly has value. But if your problem is that you don't have any developers or you don't have nearly enough, uh, we think no code is a better approach for a lot of people. Great. So, you know, continuing along these lines, we hear the word citizen developer or the, the term citizen developer. Uh, is this a no coder? Is there a difference? What, how would you define citizen developer? Yeah, that's, it's really not my favorite term because I think it's a little confusing. I mean, what's a citizen in this context? Um, but it really means somebody who builds applications and that somebody has 
no technical training or maybe just not technical background. They might be trained on that no code application, but they're not trained, they don't have a computer science degree, probably that kind of thing. So, you know, the good thing about that, as I kind of alluded to when we were talking about no code is there's a big shortage of IT and computer science skills in the world, in the marketplace. And so almost no companies can hire enough developers to build all of the custom software they want. So citizen developers fill that gap. The other benefit there is that the citizen developers typically already understand the requirements for the custom app pretty well. Uh, so the whole step of writing a long document to explain what's needed and handing that off to developers who don't quite understand it and build a little bit of the wrong thing and there's back and forth, you, you streamline that process quite a bit. And that's the other nice thing about having citizen developers directly go build your application. The downside is that you know, IT as a discipline has been around since maybe the 60s or 70s. And in that 50 plus years, they've learned a lot about what to do and what not to do to support the business with technology. And so you don't want the citizen developers to be going nuts and kind of relearning all of the hard lessons that IT has learned. Um, and I think you know, the, where that comes out the most or maybe is the most obvious is in change management. Another area would be security. Uh, and so part of the solution there is for a vendor like AirSlate to really help people who are building apps build them in a secure way. And we do that in a lot of different ways with permissions and sort of security by default in the application and also help them manage change. Uh, you know, anytime you've seen your Salesforce down for maintenance, that's because of uh, proper IT led change management. And the question is, can we help non-technical people make changes to their flows without taking down the flows that are already up and working. And so we've got some features like that. We're working on a lot more. It's a big area of focus of development. Uh, since we're sort of talking about um, actually building out applications, I wanted to ask a couple of questions about what it looks like to actually implement AirSlate. So the, you know, the first question is who, who does that? Yeah, so we talked about the citizen developers a little bit. And so you know, sometimes identifying who the right people are to step into that role is one of the things you just need to be mindful of. Um, typically people who have a lot of complex spreadsheet building experience, for example, could be good at that. The people who configured your SharePoint site, you know, they might be good citizen developers. Um, but our general preference as to who does it is that our customers do it. We don't um, have a bunch of special tools at AirSlate that our customers don't have to go build these flows. The customers have all the tools they need to build the flows totally from scratch and get productive and get things automated. Um, you know, that said, of course, that's with our help and guidance and training. There's the AirSlate Academy. There's my team of solution engineers to help customers build and answer questions. Um, but sometimes we also have customers who say, hey, this AirSlate thing's really cool. I totally see why we need it and the value. We don't have anybody who's got time to learn this or we just don't want to. Um, so who can build this for us? And in that case, we have services partners that we can refer people to that will, you know, charge a fee and build those flows for you. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're bringing people who are already trained and expert in the AirSlate platform. So they're quite quick at building. So how long does this usually take? So I always say it depends to how long does it take? You know, that's a really common question. Mind you, everybody wants to know, hey, we're going to sign up for this thing. And when are we going to see value? Um, but to that end, you know, we recommend picking a first project, a first flow that can be built pretty quickly. It won't take more than six weeks, two months or so to start seeing value. And if that means breaking your project into chunks, you know, the product totally supports that and that's what we'd recommend. Once you've done that, you can start applying your learnings from that first project to the next project, the next one after that. So breaking things into chunks and starting to see value right away is really the key there. Um, you know, as far as how long it takes, I think the shortest projects probably go live in uh, two weeks, something like that. Um, the longest ones that we've seen take, you know, four to six months. But again, we recommend trying to structure a project that's shorter than that. So you mentioned uh, breaking it into chunks. Um, are there, I, I'm sure you could talk about this for hours, but what are some of the, the best practices? So in addition to scoping the project into chunks. Uh, you also want to test it in chunks. So don't go build the whole thing and then start trying to find your problems. It's way easier if you just build a little bit of it and make sure that it's working the way you expect it to. 
Um, and as you said, by the way, you know, we could probably spend a whole session like this uh, just talking about best practices. And we have a lot of this stuff documented, but I'm just trying to give people sort of a, a quick idea of the overview. Um, also, you can use the platform itself to help you test. So the best example of that is taking is configuring some extra bots. These would be bots that you wouldn't use once the flow goes to production, but a bot that just helps test by pre-filling test values instead of having to go type everything in as you're testing. So that can make things just less annoying, if anything, besides saving time, you're not having to type, you know, test one, test two, test three in every field on your document as you, as you go test. Uh, a third one that's a really good one is to look at, um, is there places where my data changes at a different rate than the overall flow. So um, you know, some of, our, some of our customers are universities. They've got forms that have lists of the majors or lists of the university departments that are available. Uh, or maybe even there's a linkage between like which professor is responsible for approving things related to a particular major. And so that's great stuff to, instead of building that into the flow, you set up a separate spreadsheet, uh, whether it's a Google spreadsheet or a Microsoft uh, Excel online spreadsheet that contains those values. You can then use a bot to take those values from the spreadsheet and populate them into drop downs. Or in the case of like which professor is responsible for which major, you have the bot go look that value up in the spreadsheet. Uh, and that way you're not having to go open the flow definition and change it. You can just change things really quickly in that spreadsheet if they change from, from week to week or semester to semester in that case. Great. Well, thanks, Colin. I think that was pretty helpful. Yeah. Good. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Hopefully uh, the people out in the social media world will find it helpful too. Yeah. And if anybody has any more questions, just drop them in the, the comments and we'll, we'll answer them next time. Yep. All right. Thanks, thanks Colin.